So my name is Alfred Fuller, and this is Matt Wilder. And we're going to be talking about how to get more nines uh, with the Hyper Application Data Store. I'm a software engineer on the App Engine Data Store team. And I am a uh, site reliability engineer on the App Engine team. Uh, my focus is distributed storage. So you may be asking yourself, site reliability, uh, what is that? Well, um, site reliability is a position at Google whose focus is the performance and reliability of Google services. So if you'd like to know a little bit more about that and what it's like running App Engine in production, um, I recommend that you attend uh, Alan Green and Michael Handler's talk this afternoon, uh, Life in App Engine Production. And uh, I can assume, I think, that you're all interested in the data store in general. And if that's true, you should check out past I.O. talks, uh, name, specifically the ones listed here, uh, to get a better understanding of how the data store works as a whole. Today, though, we're going to talk about, um, well, we're going to give you a brief overview of the data store, um, sp uh, highlighting the common infrastructure components that it actually uses, talk about the data store in production, highlighting uh, specifically common cases, uh, planned maintenance, and unplanned events, then talk about lessons learned uh, from running the data store for over three years now, and then give you some tips on how to uh, better acclimate to the high replication data store, if you so wish. So the master slave, um, so the data store comes in two flavors now. The master slave data store is what we launched with in April of 2008. It uses asynchronous replication from a master to a slave, uh, and all since it has a master, all writes and reads go to a master and then are and then are replicated to a slave. High replication, on the other hand, uh, was released this January, and it, what it does is it synchronously writes to greater than two uh, replicas. And it has no master, so it's true multi-homing in that you can read and write from any replica. So uh, in order to understand uh, how the data store works, it's important to understand uh, what it's made of. So uh, the data store is not actually one large monolithic uh, piece of software, but it's rather the culmination of many layers of distributed storage architecture. Um, lots of these layers are actually common to lots of Google services. So uh, at the top, we have the data store, which you're all probably familiar with. Um, it provides a schemaless storage to App Engine applications and provides uh, arguably one of the most advanced query engines of any distributed storage database out there. So uh, the data store stores its data directly in Megastore. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about, this layer and below, is actually a common piece of Google infrastructure. So Megastore provides a sort of SQL-like uh, interface to distributed storage. Um, it uh, has a strict schema, so you define tables and things like that, similar to an SQL database. Um, it provides multi-row transactions that can actually span machines. Um, where it's different than a standard uh, SQL database, though, is its unit of transactionality, which is centered around an any group. Um, Alfred will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, Megastore stores its data in Bigtable, which many of you may, very well may have heard of. Um, Bigtable is um, a large distributed key value data store. Um, it's not a standard database like you would think. Um, you can store data in uh, columns and access them via the row key only. Um, it's a very important piece of the data store. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. And it's widely used at Google. Um, at the bottom, uh, Bigtable stores its data in Google's next generation distributed file system, which is our successor to GFS. So you might be asking yourself, what's an entity group? Because up until the high replication data store, you re didn't really have to care that much. Um, uh, what it is, is it's a logical grouping of entities through a parent-child key relationship. And how it functions is it's a unit of transactionality, as Matt said. So transactions can only read and write to entities in a single entity group. So if I wanted to change entities in the blue entity group and entities in the green entity group, there's, there's no way to do that atomically. But if I want to do it just in the blue or just in the green, then you can perform atomic transactions on those. Um, and more importantly, for the high replication data store, it is a unit of consistency. So entity groups enforce strong serial consistency. So what you, uh, what you get or what you put, you will always get after uh, after that put, and you will never see part of a transaction. You either see all of a transaction or none of a transaction. Um, so here's an example of uh, entities that are arranged in a parent-child relationship. So we have users, we have photos, and a child entity under photos of comments. So the photo owns those comments. Their comments on the photos, uh, so probably created by the users. Uh, and then we have documents, 
and uh, revision history for those documents and comments on those documents and a blog post, which is like a combination of photos and, and documents. Oh, sorry, picture. Yeah, I said that right. Cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and has comments on those as well. Um, so if we look at the entity groups that, that are here, um, we can see that there's these uh, boundaries that, that are imposed by these entity groups. So you can operate on a revision history of a document atomically, um, but if you wanted to change a photo and a document at the same time, you actually have to do two transactions to do that. So there's some limitations besides just these boundaries on entity groups, um, the biggest of which is the throughput limitation. So we say that you can get at least one write per second. In practice, in the high replication data store, you can get uh, five to 10. And what happens is if, if uh, five writes come in at all at the same time, four of them die with a concurrency exception, and one of them gets through. So this is it's rate limits how, how quickly you can write uh, to these entity groups. However, it's important to keep in mind that a write per second does not mean an entity per second. If you use batch puts and transactions, those all count as a single write. So you can get high en entity per second throughput if you um, fan in your writes and do them in batches. Another thing that's important to note is that these can be arbitrarily large groups, groupings of entities. As, as Matt said, uh, uh, ma entity groups can span multiple machines and still enforce uh, the transactionality. Um, so we actually have entity groups with tens of millions of entities in them, and it's no degradation to performance. So here's another outline of the same entities, just uh, arranged slightly differently. Uh, taking into consideration the limitations of the, of the entity group. In this case, I've grouped all of the comments that a user makes under the user, so it's in his entity group. And if I show you the, the entity group uh, boundaries here, you can see that um, blog posts are separate from comments, are separate from documents, are separate from photos. And the reason why this grouping may be a better grouping, um, given the limitations of entity groups, is that it's unlikely for a user to write to a comment greater than one comment per second, while a blog post, if it gets popular or you know, uh, someone tweets it, uh, could spike in the comments. Um, and at, at those points, you probably want to have a higher write rate than one entity per second. So speaking of consistency, um, this is a very important thing to understand about the difference between the high replication and the master-slave data store. Um, pretty much there's only really one difference, and this is, uh, the eventual consistency for non-ancestor queries. These are queries where the entity group is not known ahead of time because the query spans multiple entity groups, so there's no way to enforce that strong serial consistency that an entity group provides. An example of a non-ancestor query um, was select to star from comment where user ID equals user dot ID. This is what you would have to use in that first grouping of entities to find out all the comments that a user has made. However, in the second grouping of entities, you can use this uh, query, which is select star from comment where ancestor is user.key. And when you do this query, you're guaranteed, guaranteed to see all the most recent results. So for a user, this is very important because they want to have, have consistency. They, they put a comment, and, they, and you redirect them to the page that shows that comment, and they really want to see the comment they just put, or they think your site's broken. So let's see why this is the case, uh, why this difference exists between master-slave and uh, the high replication data store. Um, and to do this, we have to look at the, how reads and writes operate in both systems in the common case. So for a write in master-slave, we write to the local replica, which is the master, and then we asynchronously replicate that write to the slave. So that when you read from that local master, you know the local master um, solve any writes that have been accepted by the system. So you're guaranteed to see that write. And if we look at this, this is a, a very simplified layout of one of these replicas uh, in a, a data center. So we have data center A that is hosting your application, and we have a big table A that is hosting your data. And when the data store, you, you invoke a data store write, it will write to big table A, which is the local big table in this case, and the master. And then that write will asynchronously replicate to big table B at some later point. So we return to you as soon as we write to big table A. When you do a read, that read goes directly to big table A, and you, we know that that has seen any writes that have succeeded. However, in the high replication ca case, this is slightly more complicated. Maybe not slightly. It's, it's pretty complicated. Uh, <laughs> um, so write 
you write to at least a majority of replicas. And you do this in two phases. And when you do this, it means that a minority of replicas may not have gotten that write synchronously. Then we replicate asynchronously any write that a replica hasn't seen, or we do it on demand when you do the read. Uh, we, can, we can update whatever replica you're reading from and enforce that strong serial consistency. Reads are slightly different as well. What we'll, what we'll do is we'll read from the fastest replica, which is usually the local, but can be another replica, and we can catch up on demand. So if the fastest replica isn't up to date, what, what we'll actually do, I think I have it in the, yeah, cool. I'll do it in this one. Um, <laughs> so if replica A isn't actually caught up, what we will do is we'll actually fail over, and, hold on, there it goes. We'll read from replica C instead and wait for replica A to catch up. And as soon as replica A is ca ca caught up, we'll start reading from replica A. And this is all done uh, on a sub-RPC level. So in the middle of an RPC, we can switch back and make sure you're always getting the fastest reads. Writes um, are, Complicated, as I said, there's two phases. The first phase is a prepare. Oop, wrong slide, hold on. <laughs> they look identical. identical. Uh, the first stage is a prepare, and the second stage is an accept, which actually sends out the payload, which is your entity to write. And you can see that this write is actually talking across data centers to all replicas synchronously. And as long as a majority of these data centers uh, have all your, or, or accept that write, then the write succeeds. You can see in Master Slave, I had one replica or one big table that was dark in trying to indicate that that had all the data. And in high replication, there's no guarantee that any replica has all your data at any given time. And another thing uh, that's important to note about this slide is that uh, there's no master in this case, so that we can run apps in multiple data centers. So we can have an app in data center B reading and writing uh, to, to these, uh, these big tables. and oops, and, oh, that's also important, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. This is, yeah, I should have made a distinction on these slides. Um, yes, so we can have them going all at the same time, and everyone's happy, and everyone's can seeing consistent views. And theoretically, um, if, if it was just a data store alone, we could actually be ta talking to the same entity group and writing to the same entity groups, and uh, you'd still have your data integrity maintained. So obviously, it's a, every, the world's a little slightly more complicated in the high replication, replication data store. And if we look at the latencies, this is reflected. Um, we look at the read latencies, and you can see that we've optimized the high replication, replication data store for reads. In most cases, it's almost identical to what happens in the master-slave uh, data store. So the average uh, read latency are, is identical. The write latency, on the other hand, is uh, higher. Um, because we have to do this cross data center synchronous replication, um, and we have to talk to at least a majority, uh, we have additional latency here, and it's also a two round trips. Um, so we have about twice the amount of latency. Um, however, where the high replication data store really shines is in its uh, error rates. So if we look at these average error rates, and we look at the master-slave error rate, we can see that this 0.1% uh, per uh, error rate is actually three nines, which is the purpose of this talk, is trying to get more of these nines. And is the common uh, terminology when we talk about an SLA, which is a service level agreement. Um, so in this case, three nines actually means that your data store is down for 8.7 hours a year. And I'm not taking into consideration here uh, planned maintenance or catastrophic failures. This is the ambient error rate that you can expect with the, ma the master-slave data store. With a high replication data store, on the other hand, you can see that we actually have five nines, which is many more nines, especially when you take into consideration it's its impact, uh, <clears throat> uh, which is five minutes a year as opposed to almost nine hours of downtime in, ter in terms of ambient error rates. So let's talk about uh, how these two data stores differ in some of the less common cases. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is planned maintenance. Uh, so Google data centers um, undergo uh, planned maintenance periods. Um, during these periods, uh, low-level pieces of the common infrastructure, such as networking, uh, power, cooling, uh, maybe low-level cluster management, distributed storage services, are undergo maintenances that require downtime to accomplish. Uh, most Google services, including App Engine, are able to do in-place upgrades. So, you know, we can upgrade our software and your app doesn't know about it. Um, however, with low-level things like power, it's kind of hard to do that. Um, so, you know, kind of hard to turn off machines one by one and, you know, do things like that. So, uh, 
um, Google groups these uh, upgrades into contiguous time periods. Um, that way, you know, all of these sort of chaotic maintenances can happen to the data center at the same time or as close to the same time as possible. Um, so when these cases are happening, you know, a data center can be offline for several days, um, depending upon the type of maintenance. So what does this look like for a uh, master-slave data store? Um, so when one of these maintenance periods happens to the data center that we're serving master-slave applications out of, we don't want those applications to be offline for several days while these maintenances are performed. So we need to switch which data center is currently the master and which one is the slave. Um, to do this, uh, we perform what we call a master switch operation. Um, this operation uh, involves about one hour of read-only data store, and it's a fairly complicated semi-automatic procedure that requires a, a member of the engineering team to execute a very specific set of steps to accomplish. Um, a lot of these steps depend on um, other Google services and pieces of internal infrastructure. Um, if those services aren't working well or they're experiencing unavailability, it can cause us to uh, slow down our process and it can make us miss the maintenance window that we tell you about in advance or make us be read-only longer than we want to. So um, we work hard to make sure that we catch these things in advance so that if we do find them, we will cancel the maintenance period and move it to another time period. Um, and we try to improve the process as much as we can. So let's see what this looks like, uh, given that diagram that I showed you earlier. So we have an app that's uh, reading and writing to Big Table A and replicating to Big Table B. And we are notified of a plan maintenance period, and we notify you in turn that we're going to take your app into read only. And then during the window, we initiate a read only period so that your app can still read, but it cannot write. Then we flush the replication of anything that hasn't been replicated yet um, to make sure that Big Table A and Big Table B both have identical information and all of the most up-to-date information. Then we drain data center A into data center B, and we switch the master and the slave. And during this period, since they contain them both information, uh, your app experiences no interruption in read-only service, uh, so they can both read because they're going to see the same data. As soon as we've completed that drain, we can enable the writing to your app. So now you're reading from big table B, and you're writing to big table B and then asynchronously replicating to big table A. And at this point, there's no guarantee that big table A has all of the data, thus is now the slave. So uh, what happens to high replication uh, applications when we have one of these maintenance periods? Um, they're pretty much uh, not affected at all. Um, while we do still primarily serve uh, high replication applications out of a single data center, which I'll talk a little bit more about why in a minute, um, we're able to seamlessly migrate these applications from one data center to another without almost any notice uh, to the developer or the user of the application. Um, furthermore, we're able to do this uh, without any interaction from the App Engine team at all. No, none of our team has to initiate this process. Um, the reason why we can do this is that uh, Google data centers have a system for notifying services running within them that there is, these maintenance periods are beginning, and they should move their traffic out of that data center. So when App Engine receives the signal, we automatically move the application serving in that data center to another one that's not going to go under one of these maintenance periods anytime soon. Um, as I said, uh, the switching is almost transparent. Um, what is noticeable is a flush of memcache and approximately one minute where um, you can read from memcache, but it's always empty, and you can write, and it just pretends to succeed. Um, the reason that this is the case is that we and the, and the primary reason why we only serve uh, HR applications out of a single data center is that uh, is memcache is a very fast API. You know, if you've used it, you get requests and responses back in like an order of milliseconds. Um, that's because we don't replicate it to the other data centers we serve your high replication applications from. Um, if we did, um, the time it would take that data to transmit to those other data centers would make memcache a very slow. API and not as useful for what you probably use it for. Unfortunately, even Google's limited by the speed of light. So let's see what, the, what that looks like in high replication. So we get a signal from our infrastructure team, and our system uh, automatically drains apps from data center A and uh, serves them out of data center B. And uh, then the, the, the infrastructure team takes down the big table in data center A, so it's unavailable. And when we do a read, we read from big table B. And when we do a write, we write to a majority and in this case, you can see that Bigtable A is not responding to any of our writes, but the write still succeeds because we have a majority of replicas still responding to our write. 
So uh, let's talk about some uh, other reasons why the, the nines in the data stores are different. Um, uh, no distributed storage system is perfect. Uh, Google's no exception. Um, we do have unplanned issues. Um, we, we tend to group these issues into two primary categories, global and local failures. So we're going to talk about local failures first. Um, we at Google group local failures into two other various categories, um, expected and unexpected. So it may sound a little strange that we have unplanned expected failures, but in reality, they're a fundamental part of storage Google. Um, the primary reason for this is uh, Bigtable. Um, as I said before, Bigtable is a, a very important part of the data store storage stack. Uh, it's also a very widely used, important piece of software at Google. Um, Bigtable is a, a very amazing piece of software. Um, it's able to scale to incredibly large size. It can have mind-boggling amounts of data in it, and it can support huge amounts of transactions per second, reads and writes, and it can run, span many, 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 many machines. Well, in order to make this possible, the designers of Bigtable made some trade-offs that result in data being unavailable for short periods of time. Uh, here's why. Um, at its core, Bigtable splits its data up into continuous blocks called tablets. Um, these tablets are made available by uh, processes called tablet servers. So every Bigtable cell has a lot of tablet servers, and each tablet server has a lot of tablets loaded. Now, these tablets can only sustain a certain threshold of reads and writes. Um, if they get more reads and writes than that, then performance will be degraded. So Bigtable responds to this by splitting that tablet into two or more smaller tablets. And if the tablet server serving those tablets is experiencing too much load, it will move those tablets to another tablet server, which is less, less loaded. Now, while these operations are happening, um, the data is unavailable for that period of time. Now, these operations are supposed to be very fast, but occasionally they are slow. This is one of the most common causes of unexpected local issues. Um, Occasionally, something causes these split or merge operations to be slow. Um, one example that we have noticed is um, a tablet server is on a machine that's maybe unhealthy or something is causing it to perform poorly. If this is happening, requests to this tablet server will be slower, um, and maybe those split operations aren't happening as fast as they should be. Another uh, example of uh, reasons that we have seen this performance happen is due to the distributed file system underneath. Um, when those tablets move to other tablet servers, um, the new tablet server needs to load that tablet off of Google's distributed file system. If for some reason that operation is slow, then those data is unavailable for longer while the tablet server is trying to load that data to make it available again. Um, one of the most common causes of this happening is isolation. Um, as I said, Bigtable and Google's distributed file system are pieces of common infrastructure. So multiple users of the data center use the same instance. Um, while isolation has been built in from the ground up, um, it's not perfect. Um, isolation on distributed storage systems at this scale is a, is a very hard problem to solve. So uh, what do these issues uh, look like for uh, applications that use the master-slave data store? Well, so as Alfred said, um, applications that uh, use the master-slave data store depend upon uh, a single big table to be available to support those reads and writes. So if that big table is experiencing these unavailability issues, then those translate directly into unavailability with the data store. Um, as, I, as I said, the type of availability we're talking about here is local, which means it only affects small portions of data, which means that some applications may be completely unaffected and some applications may be affected. Um, what does this look like? Um, the most common uh, thing that this will present itself to its users is those random deadline exceeded errors that you'll see in your application's error logs. Typically in the stack trace, you may see a data store RPC or something like that. Um, if the problem persists for a long time, um, requests can back up in your request queue, and it can actually begin to affect requests that don't actually involve the data store. Um, if you have a master slave application, you may have experienced this unavailability, and you may have noticed that maybe this app engine status site doesn't display that their data store is having any issues. The reason for this is that at its core, the app engine status site currently uses actual applications to monitor the health of the various APIs and present them on the status site. So 
if those applications aren't being affected by this local unavailability, it may not show up on the status site, despite the fact that it's affecting you. Um, it's important to note that um, our internal monitoring does catch these issues, and when they happen, we are notified, and the on-call engineering team will respond to them as quickly as we possibly can. We're also working on improving the status site to better catch and report these type of issues. So let's look, what this, look at what this looks like. So we try to do, your application tries to do a read, and it fails. We try to do a write, and it fails. We just get no response. We retry this, and eventually it times out. However, there is one thing that you can do to improve this scenario in your, in your application's case, which is to enable eventually consistent reads. In this case, what will happen is your application will try to read, which will fail, and then it will read from the slave instance, which may have stale uh, data, but uh, in some cases that's acceptable. And in these cases, we recommend that you enable this if you're going to use master-slave. So how do these uh, issues affect applications that use the high replication data store? Um, in short, they have no impact at all. Um, as we've mentioned, uh, high replication applications don't depend on the health of a single big table cell in order to perform. So if the local big table to your application is experiencing these problems, requests will seamlessly fail over to another big table. And this happens on a per, uh, per request basis with no interaction from anyone whatsoever. I should point out that I, I made the tech lead of Megastore, which is, he's one of the masterminds behind uh, the Paxos implementation that runs a high replication data store posed for this picture. Um, so let's see what this looks like. Um, so we have a local failure. So your app tries to do a read from big table A, and it'll immediately fail over to big table C without any loss of consistency. And it can do this because we're operating on entity groups. And if big table C doesn't have the most current data, it can on demand replicate that data. And in fact, when we do this operation, we'll look at all the replicas and see which one does have the data and prefer that one so we don't actually have to block on the catch up that has to happen uh, in, a, in, a, in a replica that doesn't have that data. And when we do a write, it simply doesn't affect the algorithm because we only require a majority in these cases. So you don't see any user visible uh, effect. And eventually, since we track the health of these uh, big tables, um, will the, the health tracker will decide that big table A is either slow or being unavailable, and it won't even try to read from it. It will actually just read from another replica that is the fastest replica uh, to serve your rights. And eventually this error will go away, and it will switch back to reading from the, from the local replica, as it is usually the fastest. So let's talk about uh, failures on a global level. Um, um, these are the type of failures that render an entire data center either offline or unusable. Um, some examples of the causes of these types of errors is, let's say the, the fiber optic cables connecting the built data center, the network get cut, or um, there's a power outage and the backup generators fail, powering off the data center. Um, maybe there's some bug or major issue with you know lower level pieces of the infrastructure that just render the data center completely kaput, completely useless. Um, Google's data centers are really big, so uh, when these sort of things happen, it tends to take a long time to recover. Um, if we power off an entire data center, for example, you know, turning all those machines back on and making sure all the machines turn up and check their disks if necessary and start up all those processes, it takes a long time on Google scale. Um, furthermore, you know, if fiber object cables get cut, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced this, it takes a long time to get those, those cables repaired. So these things take the data center offline for, for quite some time. Now, although this is unfortunate when this happens, they do make great stories. So I will, again, plug Handler's talk uh, that comes after this. So what effect do these outages happen on master-slave applications? Well, as you can probably guess, if that data center that we're serving at it disappears, the applications disappear too. Um, it's important to note in this, this case that with Global failures, it typically is not just the data store that goes offline, but if it's like a power outage or networking, the whole um, app engine serving stack goes away, which means that it's not just the data store that's unavailable, but your whole application is unavailable. So what do we do about this? Well, um, when this happens, uh, we perform an emergency failover. Um, this is an emergency switch operation to so we can just switch applications to serve out of the other data center. Now, Master-slave uses an asynchronous replication scheme. So if we do an emergency switch, um, there's going to be some data loss uh, on a temporary level. Now, this data loss presents itself in two primary ways. 
Um, one is just unreplicated data. This is data that was written to the master and never replicated over when that master data center went offline. So this data is just missing until the other, that data center comes back and we can recover it. Um, another type is partially replicated data. This is when the data was written to the master and was in the process of being replicated to the slave when the data center went offline and we performed this uh, emergency failover. Um, in this case, we may have part of a transaction applied or part of an update made, and the data store knows that it's missing this data, and so it does not allow writes to this data until it receives the rest of that transaction or that update. Now, as I said before, this data center may be offline for a while, so we don't want to wait for that data center to come back to finish that write. So what we do is, once we finish this emergency procedure, we then go through and check the entire data store for any instance of this, uh, this partially replicated data, and we manually roll back those transactions, making your data available again. Now, eventually, this uh, other data center does come back online, and that big table comes back with it. Um, at this point, we have data in that big table that was not replicated over. Um, however, we can't just replicate that data now because you may have written to that data since or deleted it or something, and so there would be a conflict. So instead what we do is we dump the data out of that big table and provide it to the developers on, a, on an offline basis so they can decide what they think is best to do. So let's look, this, um, look at what this emergency fail, failover looks like. Reads and writes are failing, and then um, we decide that big table A is probably going to be down for a while, and it would be much uh, better for our, our users to have their sites active. Um, and so we uh, initiate a emergency failover, which just force sw swaps the master and the slave. And as you can see, big table B has never, hasn't had its replication flushed, thus does not have all the data. And as Matt said, that data is still durable and in big table A. Um, so we can recover it later, but the more important thing is to get your apps running again. Um, so now this app is uh, reading and writing from big table B. So what effect do these global failures have on um, applications that use the high replication data store? Um, well, as I said before, um, they do primarily serve out of a single data center, so when we have these major global failures, um, there is a slight a bit of unavailability, but they recover within minutes, and there's absolutely no data loss. Um, the reason why they're able to recover so quickly is, um, you remember that system I talked about when we, when we do plan maintenance, where the infrastructure can notify uh, users of that data center that the data center is going offline for maintenance? Well, when these global failures happen that take the data center offline, the same system is used to notify those services that, hey, an emergency has happened at the data center, it's unusable, move your traffic now. So when we get that signal, just like with the plan maintenance, we seamlessly migrate the applications to serve out of another data center. Um, data is written to more than one big table with the high replication data store, which means that we haven't lost any data at all. Um, furthermore, due to the masterless nature of the high replication data store, we actually provision each application so that they can lose multiple data centers and still serve normally. Um, this means that if the data center is offline for a really long time due to a tornado or a fire or alien invasion or something like that, um, your application can still experience any of the type of failures that I've talked about right now and not experience any unavailability. So this, uh, this slide should be familiar uh, because it's exactly the same as a planned failover, which is important to notice. Uh, if your application, uh, if the global failure just affects the durability layer, you will see that we will, the application will still serve and will still read and write successfully uh, because we can always use, not use big table A. Um, if it does affect the entire stack, and even when it just affects the big table, uh, the infrastructure team, as uh, Matt said, will notify our automated system, which will do a drain. And now your app is serving out of data center B. And so it's important to note that unplanned failures have the exact same effect as planned ones in the high replication data store. Um, so they, they're, um, as Matt said, your data is maintained, the consistency is there, and your application sees very little downtime. If, if any. So uh, what lessons have we learned from three years of running the App, App Engine Master Slave Data Store and in building the high replication data store? Um, first is expect the unexpected. Um, global failures, you don't expect them to happen, but they do happen. They've happened a few times to App Engine in the past, and they will probably someday happen again. 
Um, another is that the improbable is probable when you're dealing with the scale of, of Google. Um, errors that have an incredibly small chance of happening, say memory corruption or CPU bugs, things like that, happen on a regular basis when you're dealing with systems at this scale. And you have to think about them, otherwise they're going to really bite you. Another thing we've um, heard from feedback from our users uh, is that consistent performance is typically better than low latency, because low latency plus inconsistent performance is not something you can plan for. Um, uh, typically, applications that are, are built on the master-slave expect the consistent behavior uh, that they experience when they test their applications. And when uh, you ha experience these local failures, uh, you'll get random deadlines exceeded, and it'll kind of uh, speckle through those, those errors will you know, speckle through all your request logs. And, uh, well, and one important thing that, that we've actually heard back from, from developers is that uh, if they know the latencies are going to be slower yet consistent, they can typically program around that and make accommodations for that. So consistency is generally better in these cases. So another thing is the more that we can automatically handle failures, the less downtime we have for our users and the less work we have uh, operationally to keep the service running. Um, a human being is a lot slower at pushing a button and responding to an event than a computer is. And if a computer can respond to that event by failing over or doing something to avoid the error that's happened um, seamlessly, then we can hide that error from our users and present a consistent experience. And another benefit of this is that we can focus on more features for, for developers, such as next-gen queries, uh, <laughs> if any of you have, uh, remember the talk from last year, I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, one thing we really noticed is that unavailability is never good. At, uh, small percentages at Google scales have a big impact on, on many apps. Um, so that when these local failures happen, they typically affect uh, an app um, to a large degree, even though it doesn't affect the entire cluster. And uh, these types of problems um, well, they're important to us to fix, because we want every app to, to um, have a good experience on App Engine, and we hope that the, master, the high replication data store um, will address these issues. So as a recap, um, the high replication data store is, uh, has a slightly higher write latency, is slightly less globally consistent, which is in that one case of global queries, um, in it, but it's incredibly fault tolerant. So we have designed it to be geographically distributed, and it's resilient in the face of catastrophic failure. And we think that uh, uh, it will get you a lot more nines. And uh, from since launch, we, we actually we really believe this so much that we're going to set it as a default, as we announced yesterday. And we're also lowering the price to match that of Master Slave, because we, we really feel strongly in this product. So what's next? Um, well, you, we may have convinced you to uh, use the high replication data store with this talk. And you may have an application and say, wow, this is great. Well, I have a master slave application. I want to migrate to the high replication data store. So we, we have a procedure for doing this now. Um, it requires a read only period while we copy your data from the master slave data store to the high replication data store. Um, this could be slightly less ideal for applications that have a large amount of data. So we're really at hard at work. Uh, on some new migration tools that will dramatically improve this and dramatically reduce the amount of read-only period you'll need to migrate your application. And you can expect those to come out really soon. So that being said, uh, that we want you to migrate over and we think it's better for everyone, let's talk about what you have to do to, in terms of the, your, your app's logic to deal with the eventual consistency that you see in global queries. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is a code audit for all global queries, queries without ancestors in them. Because um, everything else is strongly consistent, and you can rely on it that it will operate the exact same way it's operated before in the master-slave da data store. And uh, these global queries that you, should, that you look for shouldn't just be the ones that are immediately after a put, because uh, when you have change, re change requests, like in a, in a user experience, and you put something in one request and you go to the next request, the user usually expects what they have written to show up immediately. Um, so there are many ways to handle this uh, situation once you find these queries. The first one that I would su suggest is accept it. There are a lot of queries that don't need strong consistency. When you have a write rate that is incredibly high, that it doesn't support a single entity group, in these cases, if you don't see the last 100 milliseconds to seconds, which is the type of eventual consistency we're talking about with a high replication data store, it's not 
as important. So when you, if you have uh, a Twitter stream flooding in your, into your app, in these cases, eventual consistency is um, acceptable. Another thing you can do is avoid it. So you can I isolate the cases where you actually can um, have this limit of uh, the write rate for the entity groups and build larger entity groups, because entity group size can be arbitrarily big. So as long as you trickle it in, um, you don't have to worry about uh, you know, the, getting over that, uh, you know, how, how big your entity group actually is. And then one of the most interesting things you can do um, is work around it. And you can do this by mixing data store results. So in that example I showed you um, previously, where the comments were clustered under the user, and we had the blog post that was separate in a separate entity group, if I wanted to show a user the comments for a blog post, I would actually perform two queries. One query would be a strongly consistent query that has the user as an ancestor, so it gives me all of the user's comments. And I know I've seen, I see most of, or all of the user's comments that he's posted. And the other one that grabs everybody else's comments. Because it's really important that the user sees his own comments. But if he doesn't see the, last, the comments that were posted in the last 100 milliseconds, it's not that big of a deal in, in these situations. So you really have to look at your app and decide where, what, 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 what one of these methods to use use where. Another, another option here is you can use memcache to store writes, uh, to have a write cache and inject those um, into your data store query results as well. So that's it. Um, we're open for questions. <laughs> I guess it's the front mic, I don't know. Yeah. Robert. So about next gen, no. Um, <laughs> so I have a hopefully easy question. If you do a batch get across entity groups and you do it with eventually consistent, uh, you know, if you set up the RPC eventually consistent, will that cause the tablet that winds up getting hit to catch up if it's late? So it'll, I know it'll fetch and return what's yeah. there. But does it initiate the catch-up sequence so in the background? You, you still have a benefit of having, doing eventually consistent reads in the high-replication data store. It will not catch up the replica and always just pick the fastest in that case. Okay. So you're, you're guaranteed to have a little boost in, in many cases. Uh, the reason for this is that we don't know what the entity group is if it's spanning entity groups. Oh, this is different, though. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this is for batch gets. That's batch get. Oh, yeah. okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, is there any information or ways to control where the data goes? And if, especially for the case of Megastore, if you start running passwords across, say, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so we, we don't currently offer any sort of um, uh, different uh, geographic distributions for our data. Oh, so it runs in a single data center? No, no. so, so we, we, ha we have one set. Um, specific and one geographic uh, set of distributed databases, uh, data centers, um, but we don't offer any sort of locality. Uh, so we, okay. they each run in a different data center, and all data centers are currently in North America. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. um, but if you want to have fast uh, operations in other uh, places, you, you should use caching headers. Okay, thanks. Uh, one question I had. Oh. Go ahead. When you mentioned about the tablets and how it stores the data in the tablets and splits that, what's the decision path about what data gets stored and what tablet where, and how does it know what tablet to go get it from? So all this is built into Bigtable, basically. Um, oh, the, the question was, um, how does the tablet uh, logic work? Where how does it know where to fetch the data and when to split and stuff like that? So um, it's all part of the the Bigtable service. Um, uh, there's metadata and things involved uh, that that is updated when these things happen, which is part of the reason why there's brief unavailability is because the tablet moves and certain things have to be updated. And that takes just a little bit of time to happen. So is it like a hash off of the key or something like that? Um, I, I can't really comment much on the specific implementation. OK. Thanks. There's some, there's some big table papers. I don't know if they actually go into that much detail, but they're, they're yeah. a nice read if you're really interested in that level. Okay. There's Thanks. also a megastore paper that is very accessible and I would, I would really recommend anyone who's interested in the exact details of this algorithm. This was a very uh, glossed over view of what actually happens in terms of rights. And so if you're interested, I highly recommend checking out that paper. 
For the uh, high replication data store writing to the majority of data centers, how many data centers are we talking about? Is that something? More than two. More so than two. We, we, we can't tell you the exact numbers, yeah. um, but it's more than two, and we can withstand multiple data centers going down. Right. I think it's also odd, it's an odd number, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It is an odd number. Yes. <laughs> it's hard to have a majority without an odd number. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the uh, Entity groups, is there a what are the practical limits on how big an entity group could be? I mean, from what you described, it sounds like you, should, you can just throw everything into one entity group, and yes, obviously yes. that's probably not wise. And do those uh, limitations change with the uh, high replication data store? So the limitation is just on throughput. And uh, JJ, uh, the picture I showed of the guy who actually in in designed entity groups and was kind of the, the, the mastermind behind that, um, would suggest to you that you put all your entities in, a, in an application to a single entity group. Now, we want your application to scale if you get hit really hard with traffic, and that's good for you and good for us, so we won't make that exact same uh, recommendation. But if you're expecting a write rate of less than one write per second for your app forever, say it's an enterprise app, you can, you can definitely put all of your, your data into a single entity group. Uh, one question about the uh, high uh, replication uh, strategy. So how can you decide the uh, global order for the transaction if the transaction comes to different uh, uh, server, I mean, the, the nodes in the cluster? Um, so the question is, uh, how, we can, how can we decide the global order of transactions if they yes. come in from multiple servers? Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, she told me to repeat the question. So. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you're mic. <laughs> Uh, so, um, before you, uh, so we use optimistic locking, right? Uh, so what happens is the transaction will start on both uh, replicas, but only one will succeed if they're happening concurrently. So the serial consistency is enforced in that we know that only one can, 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 can succeed in this case. And we use optimistic locking because uh, someone who starts a transaction may die or may stop or may never complete it or may take forever, um, so that we know that we can, we can push writes through, even in the case of failure or, or long, like, like if you use pessimistic locking, you'd have to wait for the lock to expire if the writer disappears. Um, so we use this for fault tolerance, and it also makes it so that it works well. So uh, this, stuff, I mean, this part is handled by the, the Chubby? Oh, it's it's, uh, it's part of a so, mega store. So the so the prepare and accept mm -hmm. is is what happened. What, how that gets around. So if you uh, prepare and then someone else prepares, they um, they overwrite your prepare. And if you try to get everyone who agreed for, to your prepare to accept, you'll get rejected. Um, and then we have a back off to make sure that it's, that this pattern doesn't keep on going. Because the next thing you do is you try to prepare again. And so you fight back and forth. And there's a back off to make sure that this doesn't go on forever and someone eventually wins. Thank you. I have a question about the performance limitation of tablet splitting when you have a monotonically increasing indexed value, like a ti date timestamp. Is that less of a problem with the high replication data store than the master slave? Um, I, yes. Um, it's still a problem. Um, so the question is, is, when you're writing to the same spot in a table, uh, say, a monotonically increasing uh, index based on a timestamp um, that creates a hot spot in the table, and the tablet can only split um, in the existing data that it has. Uh, and the smallest it can split is a single row. So if you write to a row a lot of times, you, you, can't, you would have a hot spot that you can't actually split. Um, but this, this, will, this will limit your write rate in master slave to empirically about 200 writes per second um, to that spot in that index. Um, and it's a problem that, that Bigtable can't really resolve for you. Um, and so with a master slave, what would happen in this case is those writes uh, would fail in one data center that's getting a lot of traffic, and then that traffic would bleed over to the other data centers where the write wouldn't fail, because the asynchronous replication um, isn't, isn't hammering it as hard. Uh, so in this case, it will help, but it will not solve the problem. To, to really solve that problem, you have to you do use some sort of sharding on that index to make it uh, split among different tablets. Yeah, it, it'll, it'll help for a while, but eventually all of the replicas will have the same problem, 
And so you're just kind of delaying the inevitable, basically. But you know, you you get up to like 400 instead of 200, or yeah. 600 instead of 200. <laughs> but I don't know the exact numbers, and the numbers that I am saying right now are definitely uh, empirical that I heard from from <laughs> Brett Slotkin, who runs Pub Sub Hubbub. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, along the same lines of the guy asking about entity groups and recommendations, do you guys have any documentation about um, the best use of entity groups or any recommendations about how to, how to group your data? Um, aside from coming to Google I.O. or watching the videos, because that's <laughs> the only place I've been able to find it in the past. Um, I think that's a very uh, good point. Uh, I think we should improve our documentation around this, and I know that um, we are, uh, there's several people who are going to try to do that internally. The Megastore paper is a good resource, and my recommendation would be to look at the throughput you need and base it on that. And usually, what you can, you can think about this is a lot of uh, micro databases. Each entity group is like a micro database. And so, from the example I gave, the micro database is based around a user, right? So, where, where the user really cares about that consistency. Whereas the interactions between users can be a little less, uh, you know, we can be a little looser around that, around that consistency. So, oh, and Anderson, Dan, Dan Sanderson. Sanderson, yeah, Dan Sanderson's App Engine book uh, apparently goes into talking about this as well. Yeah, I have some question about this writing part. Mm -hmm. uh, I read those Google Fire systems, and then usually when you write, usually it is kind of serial write. When you write one, and then they will just uh, write, replica write each other like that. But is, when I see your uh, presentation, it looks like uh, one write application talk to all the, all the replica at the same time. Is it like uh, change it, or you are using some kind of group, like a group communication to do that, or it is just a serial? We Still. use we use we write asynchronous or we write in parallel mm -hmm. uh, to multiple data centers mm -hmm. using in, inner data center bandwidth. So mm -hmm. we we go along around these boundaries, but inside the um, the data center, it's probably more, I, don't, I can't really speak to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, usually in the, uh, data center they have a, a clo close locality, right? So I saw in Google Fire System f version one they just using one close. Uh, replica, and then that replica will find the, their neighbors like yeah. that. And so then the final will return, say, everything complete. Mm -hmm. That was what I understood. But it, so is that, it that would happen inside a single data center, but uh -huh. we're, we write to multiple of them, right? Yeah, so I mean, on that level, I'm, uh -huh. I, I don't know exactly how it works, but it sounds reasonable. <laughs> yeah, so I was just wondering if it change it, or if it change it, then oh, the so underlying should be a lot of different things yeah, need so, to be done. Um, so the, the underlying uh, stuff is a little bit different, um, but um, we haven't really released any information about how it's different, so I can't really comment much. Um, yeah. 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 But I read some paper about this Google Fire system you published in yeah. the yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're yeah. using another version of that that's similar, but not the same. The, 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 the primary difference that we've actually talked about is that the original one had a single master, and this one is multi-master. That's, okay. that's the primary difference. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Well, I guess that's it. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.